Okay. Yeah. So, uh, uh, my YouTube officer, can you please check that? Uh, how is my voice today? And how is uh, how is otherwise? How is looking? I also need to put my uh, phone on to see. Uh, let me see. Check for Apple to see it here. The screen is not good. Okay, okay, for me it actually looks very good. So what about my voice? I'm not really understandable. Let me put it this way. Distort it again. So, I mean, what the heck is it? This should be really state of the art, you want. But I guess it is not. So it's sounds that I'm, uh, you know, so that my voice is not clear. Oh, boy. Oh, awesome. So, that's, you know, that's what I would like to do. So, the mic, it should be this mic. It should be all right. So, uh, is, it, is it understandable? But not pleasant. Not pleasant. Does it make it any better if I do this down a little bit? Like, uh, any improvements? Thanks, you. Know, the I was waiting for you. Because I owe you something. You know? Remember that. Yes. You never forget that. <laughs> okay, so how is it understandable? So we're still in a mic check. Very quiet. Okay, so uh, what about this? Is it, is it? Okay, I think this is the way to go then. So if it is understandable, then we're good. All right, so this is the way to get started. Simulation of the mechatronic machine, lecture number 12. You know, you know what is this lecture to you? Yes, it is the final lecture. So no more lectures up to today. Today's lecture, so this is it. So last lecture. Now what is that we're going to do today? Well, you know, the, I would like to explain about this real-time simulation. And not just the real-time simulation, but I would like to look at that a little bit of more broader perspective, like where is that we can actually use simulation. I will actually explain about the real-time simulation and how and use that as an example, how that can be used in the different product processes. Because often there is a misunderstanding or misconcept that the simulation is something that can be used only in product development. And yes. It can be used in a product development, but it can be used in many other product processes. It can be used in production, it can be used in marketing, it can be used in a service business. How that actually works out? What are the examples in those product processes that I will explain to you today? So a little bit about that, and then summary. What is that I'm expecting you to know when you're going to next midterm exam that will be in the week 51? So not next week, but week after that. So what's the, what are the core conduct that you must know when you get into your exam? And then, of course, there will be a word ceremony at the very end of the lecture, an award ceremony. You know, I hand over these uh, lunch coupons. Then we're going to, you know, have a group hug, coffee coupon. We're going to sing a song about multi-body dynamics. Seriously, there's a song about multi-body dynamics. You can type it in a YouTube and uh, you know put it in a multi-body song, and you will be surprised. So maybe after break, we are not gonna sing it, but we can listen to that. Okay. But anyways, so this is uh, today's lecture. But uh, prior to jumping that lecture, let's look what we discussed two weeks back. Because last week I was out of my office, so I could not finish uh, the course. But this is what we discussed two weeks ago. So we discussed about description of flexible bodies, and uh, we also finalized the description of uh, uh, hydraulics, but I will get that back to that when I'm explaining the recap. But uh, shortly, regarding the, the flexible bodies, we concluded that there are two different approaches. The one approach that is, typically speaking, not really in the field of flexible multi-body dynamics, 
because basically you're just using a series of rigid bodies. And then we're connecting these rigid bodies together via springy elements. And that method here, it is called lamp mass approach. And the one that is shown here, you know, this is the lamp mass approach. It's based on the idea that you have original, typically beam-like body. A little hard to use in any other shape of the bodies except the beam-like bodies. And then you divide the, your original body to number of rigid bodies. And then between the rigid bodies, you will introduce the spring elements. And these spring elements, of course, they will have an axial stiffness, you know, torsional stiffness, bending stiffness, everything that represents the beam-like behavior. And that's what it makes it possible to describe flexibility. The problem in this approach is that you know, it has this tendency to su suffer from, uh, you know, uh, numerical stiffness. And the numerical stiffness here is something that uh, means that uh, they are very high frequency and very low frequency. And this numerical stiffness is something that uh, is a little extra problem when you're trying to solve things in forward of time. There are techniques that can alleviate a little bit of this problem, but still is something that is better to avoid it if you can. And when you use this method, you, it's very hard to avoid it. Now, uh, you know, just an just alternative for this method is the floating frame reference formulation. This is a method where we actually combine finite term formulation and multi-body system dynamics. So multi-body system dynamics would be used to describe a reference motion. The reference motion is kind of like the same that rigid body motion, except that in you know, strictly theoretically speaking, there is no such thing like rigid body mass. So there's not a great term to call it rigid body mass. The better term is a reference mass. The motion where everything is measured, you know, with respect to that reference mass. And now, you know, what we do then is that we have this reference motion that is described by using multi-body system dynamics, and then we have a small deformation that is described with respect to reference motion. But that's something that we will use, we will describe by using a finite term method. An example is here, we have here a particle, which of course is not a particle, but it's a nodal location. And due to the force that is applying, say, this particular point, you know, there's a certain amount of deformation. The amount of deformation here is described by U, U bar F, and the U bar, well, U bar, and the U bar is described by using a finite term method. That's the concept of floating frame reference formulas. It's very frequently used, it's very efficient, and it can be even used in real-time applications. Now, the problem typically is that if you look at the conventional or typical uh, model of finite element based on the finite element approach, the model typically consists of a very high number of decreasing freedoms. It's not at all unusual that there is a Hundred thousand degrees of freedom. It could be a million degrees of freedom. It could be ten million degrees of freedom. And this is where we have a little bit of problem because the deformation, the vector u bar, must be solved every single time step. Now, if the model where the deformation is actually described is very large, see again the million different degrees of freedom, this is becoming computationally very difficult to carry out. Now. The way this can be solved or where this can be handled in practical application is that you can use a modal reduction. In the modal reduction, you are describing the deformation by using certain number of assumed deformation modes. Because you know, if you have this finite term method or finite term model, let's put it this way, that consists of say million degrees of freedom. What that is standing, what, what's the physical interpretation of that? million degrees of freedom. It means that the, the model can deform in a million different ways. Million different ways. You know, some of the deformation will be very exotic, and they will be associated to very high frequency. And a modern reduction technique, we simply cannot get rid of some of the very complicated deformation modes. And assuming that, you know, the lower deformation, I mean, the, the deformations that are associated to lower frequencies are the most important ones. That's an assumption we do. Sometimes it is justified assumption. Sometimes you need to use a, a 
a little bit of higher frequencies as well. But that's uh, what this formulation is about. And now I have two animations just to demonstrate like what are these lower frequencies and what are the higher frequencies. I'm kind of demonstrating like, putting, you know, providing a little bit of light like, okay, what it means like when you have these higher frequencies. These are, the, this is PDF, so I can play the video for you. So let, me, let me take a look at this. Huh? Okay, hopefully this goes fine without significant delays. Okay, so the, this is what I would like to show you. Okay, and then uh, this one. Okay, so these are the deformation modes. You know, this is a uh, structure that describes, uh, you know, just a simple hydraulically driven crane. And this crane, you know, the hydraulic cylinder is connected to, let me see if I can make a drawing, is connected to here. This end is connected to piler. And the typical uh, loading is along the y direction. And this is the coordinate system. So y direction that is like up and down. You know, now when you when you compute when you actually compute the eigenvalue on this, which is kind of like showing what are the natural frequencies, now so we say the deformation modes, one of the lower deformation modes look like this. This makes a lot of sense. Like if you think about that there's a hydraulic cylinder again connected to the place where there's this red arrow and then there is a maybe a mass of kind that is say here. It's quite likely that this is a deformation mode that is significantly destruction. And now, if you look at another detail here, you know the frequency I saw said that this mode is a 50, 51 hertz, 52 hertz. So is that frequency-wise quite low number? And typically, this is something that is important for the description of deformation of this body. Okay. Then there is a you know, another deformation. This one here. This is a second deformation mode. You know, the frequency here is 147 hertz, so the frequency becomes higher, but still probably quite important, quite important. And what about this? This typically may be, I can make an assumption that is less significant to me because the deformation is out from the plane where the loading is actually happening. So I don't have any, any forces that can introduce the, the vibration in this direction. So I could probably, neglected this mode. And this is what the modern reduction is all about. So I look at the frequency content and then I'm selecting the ones that are most important according to my assumption. Okay, these are the difficult calls. Then a little more easier cause is that when you go higher up in a frequency, now that there's a deformation like this. Then maybe this is still important because you think about the details as so is that it is hydraulic cylinder and the connection of hydraulic cylinder. Maybe this is still a little bit important. But even going more high up in, a, in the frequencies, what about this? The frequency is already 12,000 hertz. So it's quite high frequency. And how is it you can get the vibration like this? What kind of force is to introduce the vibration like this? I don't know. Magnetic forces. So we can put the magnetic uh, you know, on top of that. Uh, that uh, soft and maybe that can introduce the muscle like that. But other than that, probably not so important. So the modern reduction idea is to look at this, some of the frequencies and neglect them. So there are automated ways to neglect some of them, but this is exactly what the modern reduction is about. It is used, again, so it's used together with the loading frame reference formulas. By the way, today, so two things that did not happen in this course, and I'm a little disappointed because of that. So I never got 100 subscribers to my YouTube channel. Major disappointment. So I still need to continue as a professor. I cannot just uh, jump into YouTube live and make my living off using the YouTube. Because 100 subscribers, how much money that is worth? Two cents? Something like that. So it's not really working out. So uh, then another thing that did not happen in this course was that we never ever reached the 100% suction point. I have no eight last quizzes today. So it was, that was it. It was close case, but still not 100%.
the one thing that did make me more pleased is to see that you know your final trading from the course is very high. That would make me smile. And I really hope that that will happen. So please remember the practice seriously when you're going to return exam. Okay, that's about it. Now, this is a recap, but before the recap, let's look at the real time simulation. Now, the real time simulation, I need to turn to PowerPoint presentation. And now, I'm not, not at all sure like how this goes to YouTube. Let me first close this. Some reason I'm not able to load this to my iPad, so I need to use my computer. So let's see. I need to go here. Display capture on iPad off. Okay. I need to see how is that how it actually look in a YouTube. Okay, nothing yet. Okay, not sure if this is good or bad. Okay, so what's going to YouTube is actually my uh, you know what I can see here in my screen, and uh, that's uh, not well. You, you will see how it is. So is it uh, acceptable or so it's acceptable? Okay, so, so I would like to use it this way. I know that is a little bit annoying because you know you can see what's coming next. Yeah, you know, the next slide is available in the upper right corner of the YouTube, but that's other than that is all right. And also the, another thing that is missing in YouTube is my face. Yes, my face is missing. Uh, something good, something bad. So you can decide which is good and which is bad. Okay, so now. Real time simulation in games. So, this is the final representation, final presentation of this class. What comes after that? It's just the summary and then the award ceremony. Okay, so the, what are the items that I would like to explain today? Well, I would like to get started from the background. But this, by the way, is that uh, you could just sit back, lay back, and enjoy. So, this is supposed to be an enjoyable part of the course. You know, we went through this rocky road about. Uh, you know, virtual displays and parcel this, parcel that, delta this, delta that, that's all gone. But now we're going to look at the big picture. And I'm not sure if this is the right way to do it, but this is what I did. So hopefully, this pays back. You know, all the effort you did, and you can see the big picture. The way, so finally, you will see it. Okay. But now, the thing that I would like to explain to you today is a little bit about the background. You know, Little bit about the background, and this is this goes down actually the research here in uh, in uh, La Perra, the University of Technology, and quite a bit about our cooperation with the MEVA. And the MEVA is a university spin up located in a business park next to the university. So, a little bit about their views and uh, what are my views in the future. So, we're going to take a look at that, and then you know, how is a product process? What are these cases where we can actually use simulation? And this is what I would like to open your eyes. They, I mean, it's all right to use simulation in a product development, but I would like to use that in a little bit of different way that is being used at the moment in a product development. And more importantly, I would like to look at like, okay, what about other product processes? What are the big trends in our product development that may be coming sometime soon? So that I would like to explain. And then the finally, it's just a conclusion. Okay. And whatever you feel that something you don't agree with something, or you have a comment, or you have a question, you know what to do. Be quiet. <laughs> no, no, no. You can, you can raise your hand and you can ask. Okay, because remember what's coming the, at the very end is a word ceremony, so it's not too late, you know, to win something. And I just, you know, just to demonstrate that I'm serious about this, these are, you know, lunch. Coupons, so it's a big deal, not a big deal, but something that uh, that I promised to offer some of the students, and uh, that's what I will hand it over in a word ceremony. All right, so this is a 
this is a related to university, like that at the University of Technology, and how things are organized in this university. Most probably, uh, you are aware of the three schools we are having in the university. You know that we have a school of uh, energy systems. That's your old students in the school of energy systems, correct? You don't know. You are. I know that you are. Now, if you are in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, Department of Electrical Engineering, Department of Energy, the Energy, and then the Environmental Engineering, then you are a student of School of Energy System. And if not in a energy system, then you most probably are the student of engineering science, which is a school that where the chemistry is located, mathematics is located, physics, uh, industrial engineering is there too. What else? Guess that all. Is there something am I missing something? I guess not. Okay. And then, okay, so in addition to this kind of like technical schools, the schools that are emphasizing technology aspects, we have a business school, which is a business and management school. Okay, so what happened, uh, this was actually four years ago, we got the new president in the university. You know, the, the typical story is that you get the new president in your company or in, in your university, what comes next is a new organization. That always, that's like a, you know, kind of like a gravity or something that you cannot avoid that. So it always happens. So we got the new president, the new president, what she wanted to organize the university a little bit of a different way. So we've got these three schools that are listed here. But in addition to that, she organized a call asking university researchers to make the proposals about what could be something called research platforms. An idea of the research platforms is to, to encourage internal cooperation. You know, we uh, typically have a lot of cooperation with uh, other universities. Like if there's a university, I don't know, in Spain or Germany, be very much interested to, to do cooperation. But if there's a team next to my office, sometimes it's a little difficult. Now the new president wanted to encourage and actually change that attitude. And uh, she wanted to change things such that there is something called research platforms. And the research plans, platforms must be organized such the way that there must be a team from each one of the three schools. And this is something that there was an international call. And of course, I made a proposal. I made a proposal about the same platform. Same, you know, what that is referring to, is referring to simulation. And uh, we wanted to, to emphasize the real-time simulation and the simulation-driven design methodologies. So that includes everything. Like, when the simulation is used in the data-driven design or whatever is used in the other processes, that's where we'd like to get involved. And not just in a technical perspective, but in a perspective that there is a technical people cooperating with business people. And that proposal was accepted, and uh, that's what we are working heavily at the moment. Most of the real-time simulation studies we are doing are under the same platform. Of course, that's not the only thing we're doing, because you know, if you look at the publications, my publication. Most of the publications are from the field of flexible multi-body dynamics. So I'm still doing that, but still this whole day is real-time simulation and the new methods and new processes that's pretty much emphasized because of the same platform. Okay, so this is a picture that I took directly from uh, Wikipedia. So I'm sure you have seen this picture. So this is uh, explaining what is Industry 4.0. Industry 4.0 is something that, uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm sure you have heard it like too many times already. But this is, you know, you know, what is this Industry 4.1.0? What is that Industry 2.0 and so on and so on? So the, you know, the, the first industry was like, you know, the mechanical devices, steam power, you know, steam engines and, you know, something that, uh, you can use mechanisms to carry out some task that could be considered as an industry one point. Then the, the Henry Ford and the mass production, the simply line electricity, that could be considered as an industry 2.0. That all happened like, I don't know, more than a million years ago. So not that important for us at the moment. But historical perspective, it's you know. And then uh, industry. 
8.013 reservoirs about the computers and automation, like how to use robotics. This is pretty much what is happening at the moment. Are we kind of moving from that to the next step that is a hyper physical system? Meaning that there is a embedded models, there is a machine communications, you know, everything is, you know, in the upper level optimization. Typically, in the here, in the third generation, there's like inputs on machines without communication to other machines. And now we're moving to this next or the fourth generation, and this is where the machines are communicating. They have, there is a close interaction with humans, and now there is, this is what is kind of like a little bit about the background. That is something that we should consider when we're using the simulation. So the individual machines are no longer as important as they used to be. Okay. Then uh, one more, two more things about the background. Now, something that I also am sure you have heard before is a digital twin. You know, digital representation of machine. How is that? What is that? And, uh, you know, digital representation of machine, that really depends, uh, you know, when you think, think about the definition of that, it depends who you ask. Here's a few examples, like if you ask from some of the big consulting companies, like uh, General Electric is not really a, only a consulting company, but, you know, I, they, in their opinion, is a software representation of us and processes that are used to understand, to meet, and optimize the performance to achieve the pro business outcomes. Business outcomes. You know, this is where things are becoming difficult for people from mechanical engineering. Business outcomes. But it is important perspective and important to understand because even the simulation, you cannot go to a company and say that I want to do the simulation because it's fun. You know, it's not, you know, that is not really a good case. But you have to be able to explain that in a business perspective. So that's why, you know, the SIM platform is quite important because it's providing us this business perspective. Okay, so uh, then the Siemens, what is their representation or how is their interpretation? So they say that the digital twin is a virtual representation of physical product process used to understand the predict. So they too are saying this predict the physical counterparts performance the characteristics. So that's to be something quite important. Goldman Sachs is saying that it's a virtual representation of product created with 3D design software. 3D design software. I don't know, that sounds like uh, quite general. If you think about the like, CAT software, that can create the 3D representation. So is it really that important? But anyway, so that's uh, the interpretation. But then the corner is saying that uh, it's a digital representation of physical object, and they're emphasizing the data. So the data is part of the deal. You know, if you think about the digital twin, the digital twin is kind of like what we're doing here. It's a kind of like uh, one way to say simulation. And the simulation should have virtual representation Capability to understand and predict, capable to produce data. This data is actually becoming increasingly important. And then there's some thoughts like, okay, what if giving up the numerical models and just you know use them to produce the data, make something that is called meta model. And then the meta model is a huge collection of data, but that can be used by using, I mean, using this big big data tool sets so we can actually understand different relations in a product. But just handling the data, nothing else than the data. Okay, this okay, this goes a little bit in the future, but the data is quite important. Okay, so let's look at what is that. Hopefully the, the voice is on. So let's look who is the Mavia's interpretation about digital twin. Okay, so how can I put that? Oh no, 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 not that. Hold on. Can you hear this if I put this as loud as I can? Okay, and then run this again. Green light, green light. 
Okay, hold on. So not enough. Okay, where can I find a way to, to make this more loud? What is this? Now the problem is that if I, because there's only one place for mic or loud speakers, if I take this off, I probably lose my my voice. Let's try it again. Let's let's try it if I can. Hold on. No, still not. Hold on, suppose that I can, uh, so what is that I should do? What is using this? For two mic. Uh, is it becoming too complicated? So why not? Because this is a, it's to your mind, so it should be able to transfer the sound as well. So why not? Mike. Mike, mute it. No, no, this is just another mic. Because maybe I can. Or we can. It's a little sad that we don't have a sound because many of the, the videos that I have today, they comes with the music or a sound. So uh, let me take this back. And my, my YouTube, please, can you check like if my voice is back? Kind of back. Kind of back. Okay. Off. Mic muted. Is my voice coming through the mic? No. Here now. On. So we have a way to go. It's a little bit of an orthodox way to go, but. Okay, definitely. Definitely not the way to go. I'm very sorry about that. Very bad idea. Okay, so my my final effort is this. I will let me see. The speaker, hey, maybe it's gonna be better. Manufacturing machines can be a complex and costly process. Assembling the first prototype from parts that haven't been developed or tested together will often cause problems, and getting everything to function properly may require significant amounts of materials and... Why? Why? Why this? Because it seems that it automatically wanted to lower the voice. I play with it like this. Manufacturing machines can be a complex and costly process. Assembling the first prototype from parts that haven't been developed or tested together will often cause problems, and getting everything to function properly may require significant amounts of materials and effort. And nobody wants to be known as the manufacturer of poor and unreliable. Mavea combines all plans for your machine into a single virtual model called Digital Twin. 
This includes all the components necessary to build your machine, such as the interface to the real control system. The digital twin that is created is a virtual physics-based representation of your machine, capable of simulating its behavior and use in real time. The Mavea software simulates real-life physics, so the machine can be tested in different environments and on the actual tasks that it's designed for. You will be able to detect potential problems before anything is even built. The digital twin can be inspected and modified when necessary, and stakeholders can also get involved in the development process at an earlier stage. The rapid development iterations that the digital twin enables will result in fewer prototypes, reduced costs, and faster lead times. Moreover, Mavea's solutions allow operators to use the simulation for training, which means they will be qualified to use the machine before it even exists. The digital twin lives and evolves throughout the life cycle of the product. Once connected, the digital twin can analyze the machine's use and behavior in the field and provide vital feedback. This data can also be used to develop the product further. With Mavea's digital twin software, you can develop even the most intelligent and complex machines with ease and change the way you engineer and operate your products. Read more about Mavea Digital Twin on our website. Okay, so you hear it? Okay, good. So we get to continue. So, uh, so they they mentioned about uh, physics space. The physics space. When you think about the physics space, the picture we looked in the very beginning of the class is actually becoming extremely important. By the way, can, can you check that my voice is still all right? Because you know, I, I unhook and hook again my, my mic. But hopefully it comes with a good quality voice. Or, yeah, not really. So what's up with that? So, understand. Okay, yeah? okay, that's enough. That's enough. So we cannot, you know, ask more than that. So if it is super understandable, let's stay with that. Okay. And I, I don't, you know, I... Particularly for this class this year, I wanted to make an impression about the voice because every single year I get the complaints about the voice quality. So that's why I first this what they say that it's like really you know, state of the art mic microphone system, but maybe I'm not the same. It could be like the best you can think, not the best you can think, but you know, the, the good one with a reasonable price. Okay. Anyway, so first, physics space. So what is needed to make something in a physics space? And this is quite important because, you know, you have to have this representation of working process. The working process could be deformable ground, like in an excavator model you can find in a sim studio. And then you have to have a mechanical representation of representation of mechanical structure. That's those, uh, you know, steel structures or whatever it is that kind of like the mechanics of the machine. Then the actuators that we discussed, those typically are hydraulics. They could be something else. And the control system must be involved as well. And the user. And typically the user, the simplest way to include the user is actually take the man, take the human. And I, you know, ask him to, or him or her to, to run the machine. And this is, you know, when it actually has a close physical representation. It requires quite a bit from the visualization. It requires quite a bit about how is the environment itself, because the human can recognize the differences between the reality and the simulation quite easily. Okay, so this is an example of what the simulation model can be. You know, this is that excavator in a virtual environment with the deformable crown. So it's exactly the same model that you can find in a sim studio, and this is what you can operate in a sim studio. This picture is not from the sim studio, but the same machine in Mevea environment, I mean Mevea, Mevea office space, but the same idea. Now this visualization is based on Mevea visualization. And uh, you know that in a game environment, there are better visualizations available. Like typically the games, when you think about the quality games, they are either based on Unity or Unreal Engine. So those are the like really the high-end visualizations. And uh, I have examples about both of them, how to use the real-time simulation, maybe I engine together with the Unity first, and then the Unreal Engine. So let's look at the Unity. 
this is a real environment. This environment exists in some of the places close to, I don't know where exactly, but somewhere in Finland. Okay, so this is made by using one of those uh, camera technology that you can put the camera to one of those flying things. What are these flying things called? Drones, yeah, drones. So, and then you're flying around and you create the picture based on that. And then you do uh, quite a good amount of manipulation. And after manipulation is ready for Unity environment. But in Unity, you can actually purchase the different environments too. The next example is about the Unreal Engine. In Unreal Engine, there is a different kind of environments available. You can just go online and purchase the one, like exactly like, like what we did. And then the engine, you know, the one that is computing the physics behind, that is based on Nevea. Now, uh, this is how the Unreal Engine looked like. And the good thing about the Unreal Engine and Unity is that they all, or they both support the goggles, VR goggles, and uh, I guess that they also support the uh, augmented reality goggles. So it's something that makes quite exciting to make a models based on the Unreal Engine or Unity. So this is based on the Unity. Uh, I would like to apologize the music. I guess that this is one of those free music you can download. So this guy is using the VR goggles and is making a kind of like a settings to his model by clicking two icons and then the, after the, the tuning is done, then uh, you're ready to jump into the machine. And then you can ride around. This is the machine. Oh, this is music. Now I hope that the loudspeaker is not working. Highly detailed graphics, awesome. The leaf is there too, so you can have a representation of your hands. So this environment is one of those environments you can go and purchase online. So they cost like 50 euros or something. So they're not, they're quite affordable actually. You can make a game by a game by yourself. Except that there's no target, there's no excitement here. It's just driving around. Yeah, and then, you know, still, Still, I'm not in a third process, but the one more thing that I would like to mention it is not long ago I was uh, participating to conference where uh, some of the colleagues they they make a statement that the real time is equal than the waste of time. They said that because you know they said that the real time is equal the waste of time because the real time simulation models are not accurate representation of reality. So that's what they claim. And they said that, okay, this is, you know, none of this stuff, stuff, may, stuff make any sense because of this, you know, these models are not capable to predict the reality accurately. Now, I wanted to go back to this picture because, you know, uh, I've been in this business, like you can tell from my face, quite a while already. So, uh, so uh, I still remember when we use, uh, you know, supercomputers to run things, you know, like just a few seconds and it took hours to compute it. And how were the models back then? Well, the models back then, they were like pretty much equal than the 
you know, the mechanical models that you can have in a real-time simulation at the moment. But back then, we have very lousy representation of actors. Practically, it was like not according to reality. But today, we have actuated models that are way more accurate than back then. And then the control system is way more accurate than back then. But the big difference is this. Now it's possible to account the users. And if you think about the performance of the machine, often it's all about the user. The example is my, my car. You know, I have one car in my family, two users, me and my wife. Okay. When I'm driving a car, you know, it's not the pleasant ride. You know, it's like, you know, acceleration left and right. You know, sometimes, you know, the, the tires are making that noise like, Ooh, because uh, I want to be a rally driver. So it's, it's not very pleasant. So then the next user is my wife. Very small, very pleasant. You know the difference? Very same car, it's all about the user. But the user makes a big difference. It makes a big, big difference in the passenger cars. It also makes a big difference in the, you know, mobile machines and the machine itself. Except the industrial application where you just press the button and that's it. So there the user makes no difference. But, you know, most of the application user is quite important. And a few years back, there were no way to take account the user itself. That was still not possible. Now it's possible to take that into account. And also, there were no really good models about the working process. Say, deformable ground or forest was not available at the time. So it was just kind of using the imaginary, you know, the working processes. And that's not very much according to reality. So the real time, waste of time, I don't think that at all. And I think quite, well, quite much uh, opposite. And just to give you a proof, like, okay, are they really close representation of reality? This is a, a big company uh, that is making a different kind of mobile machines. They wanted to compare, like, who is the measured data versus the simulated data and do they match and this is you know the case where there's an excavator making a you know making an operation moving dirt from one place to another extremely difficult to simulate because you know maybe we can have a close representation of mechanical components hydraulics and control system and such but the environment is very difficult to describe accurately but what is how were the results so these are the results and of course, you don't see the details, but you can see that, okay, the red color, and the green color, more or less match. And this is difficult to do. This is a great, very nice accomplishment. So I don't personally think that the real time is a waste of time. But that's my opinion. You can make opinion by yourself. Finally, product processes. And today, I don't want to make any breaks today. Is that all right? Can you handle this? No, but let's still make it. Okay, so let's look at the product processes. I want to, maybe a little later we can have a short break, but let's just, just go. Okay, so these are the product processes examples that what, I, what I would like to explain to you. And of course, yeah, we will get started something that we are very much familiar with, product development. And the product development, you know, the systematic product development, the systematic design process, you know, that the simulation can be used there in many different phases. It can be used in a concept design phase. It can be used to compare different ideas, different mechanisms and details. It could be used there. But I don't want to go there because, you know, that's more like conventional usage of product development or of con conventional usage of simulation in product development. And I want to use this, this advantage that we can actually account the user. And that's something that I feel that is quite exciting. And how that is something that we can actually account in a product development that I would like to explain. Then a uh, few examples about the marketing, uh, then the service business, and something that is extremely important is about the new business opportunities. And there I wanted to explain something that is faster than real time. And the capabilities to predict, capabilities to predict what's going to happen in the future. Okay, but let's get started from the product development. And the first thing here is, uh, you know, that we can have a capability to have a customer feedback in a very early phase of the development in a precise format. Precise format meaning that I hate this or I like this, or I, well, I want to change this and that. That's extremely important and extremely valuable information. And we can also use a concept called gamification. 
we can set the claims and uh, try to commit the customers to be more involved to process, I mean, the product development process. And, uh, you know, this is something that is possible because of the real time solution, possible because of the digital tweet. Okay. So, first, a note. You know, this is a little bit of my experience, how it is at the moment. But if you look at the trends at the moment, it, uh, it looks that the trend is moving, or like the, the product life cycle management is moving from technical aspect and beginning to emphasize the user experience. This is, you know, quite important because I could take a, again an example about the passenger cars. You know, if you're reading those magazines that are, you know, comparing the passenger cars, you know, there could be statements like, uh, you know, this car feels like solid. This car feels like this and that. Feels like this and that. And what the heck is that? Feeling. So it's about the feelings. And the feeling is extremely important. The expected user experience is extremely important. Another example is, uh, you know, the mobile phones. You know, once you make the purchase and decision about the mobile phones, I don't expect that you go online and you check the, Okay, how is this, how is a processor and how is a battery and what are the technical specs? People don't care about that. They care about the expected user experience. So that's why this phone here that I'm holding is not Nokia phone, but it's something else. Because I'm expecting that the user experience in this phone is something that is making me very much pleased about it. And I don't care about how is a battery life. So the battery life could be half a day. That's fine if the user experience is in a certain level. The same trend is happening in other products where it's difficulty matching that the user experience is important. Example is, a, one more example is about the diesel engines that are made by Vertila. Vertila is a Finnish company and they're making a diesel engines that, well, they cannot actually fit to this lecture room. So they are so huge that they're used in a ships. And those people that are making diesel engines this size then they're still speaking about the expected user experience. So that's quite surprising because how the heck do you care about the user experience if you have a, that huge machine or that huge engine? It's important because of the business perspective. So technical aspects, I'm not saying that they are not important any longer. They're important, but they are not enough to make a you know, purchasing decision all. You have, to have, you have to be able to produce something additionally to that. But that could be expected, you know, user experience in a different different ways. So maybe the services are very, very pleasant. Maybe the electronics involved is very pleasant. And it can provide something that is important to your business models. Now, having said that, you know, uh, what is it we can do with the real-time simulation and the simulation itself? You know, I have here two scenarios and two pictures. The one in uh, upper... The left corner is how the digital tools are used at the moment in a product development. And digital tools that I'm referring here, finite element method, multi-body system dynamics, CFD, well, all these uh, analyzing techniques, how they're used in a product development. Well, they're, well, first of all, in order to answer that, you know, we, have to answer, we have to look like, what's the purpose of the product development? Well, the, one of the, one interpretation, this is, my interpretation about the product development is that the product development is to trying to please the customers. They wanted to make products that the customer wanted to see. How is it that they actually do that? Well, they do that in a such the way that they are filling those, they're asking customers to fill up those questionnaires asking, okay, do you like red color rather than the green color? You know, would you like to have this and that? And then they're answering those questionnaires. And then based on that, they're starting the product development, and they're using these digital tools to accelerate the product development process. This is important to accelerate it. And are they really answering the, what the customers are needing? Not necessarily. And the extreme case could be that digital tools are helping us to make wrong decisions fast, but nothing else. Because really what matters is that are we able to please the customers or not? So we can change the picture. We can change the picture in a way that we can take digital tools, not all of them. We cannot really use a finite element method to build the bridge 
between the product development team and the customer. Where we can take multi-body, you know, came like environment, and we can build the bridge between the product development team and the customer. And that's possible then to understand the customer needs in a really in a way that they can see the technical specs and they can experience it before actually building from us. So that's where things become extremely important. And this bridge goes two ways. You know, the product development team, they can have a really wild idea. So uh, let's say that they want to build a you know, agricultural tractor that is capable to fly. Okay. That was like a great idea. So maybe people are gonna love this idea a lot. But knowing that you can see if they love it or if they hate it. They, you can of course build the machine and then they ask if you like it or not. But all this takes a lot of time and effort and it's not so good idea. Or you can put the simulation model, ask people to come over and test it and say, do you like this idea? So look, we have an agricultural tractor that can fly. Would you like to purchase this or not? And then they say, no, I don't want to have it. Then you stop the process. Project, or they say, I love it. I always want to have a tractor like this. So make me, I don't know, 100 units like this. So then you do. So then customers, they can have a certain level of flexibility to make it out their modifications to model. When monitoring the, the, how the modifications are carried out, you can have a better understanding how the customers are behaving. Okay, this is a example about the gamification. So this is what is actually tested by using this uh, sim studio. So there is a game kind of environment that you have a task and in the task uh, you need to move dirt from the crown to industrial hopper and amount of collision is counted if you can make a modification to this excavator. It's a little, kind of rough example but still an example of how the gamification can be used. And uh, how you can tune the model is that you can select different hydraulics and then you can select different buckets and then it's just monitoring like what is a winning combination in terms of fuel consumption, in terms of productivity, in terms of people feelings. But this is way more beyond of that question that is a more like conventional way to use a product development. And all that is tested in a sim studio for this oil jet Jedi and uh, make LX students that maybe they have never seen the sim studio but this is just an animation how it looks you guys are probably a little more familiar with this it can be used with the two machines or one machine and it is something that we wanted to keep it open 24 7. this is not possible at the moment but we are hoping that in the future we can actually monitor the human while they are using the simulators but there are many different measurements we can do we can use a you know face cameras to understand the people's feelings. Don't know really how they operate, but basically there's a cameras that are looking at your face based on the temperature they based on your, like how is your twist in your face to so tell you like how is your feeling. Don't know the details, but that's one possibility. We can use a uh, different other type of measurements like EEG, muscular activation, motion capture and such to understand better how is a uh, interaction between the machine and the, and the human and also to understand how people feel like. So these are like kind of like extra tools that, that helps us to, to really to serve the customers even the best way that even the ways that they don't they are able to understand that they are not able to express that by you know words. Okay. Here's the training. When are we supposed to close today? But uh, 345. Are you able to handle this still? Would you like to stand up and stretch a little bit? Are you just, it's just all right. Okay, you sure? Okay, let's look at a few more things. So, this is a little bit more like conventional way to use a real time simulation. And I said that uh, uh, models 10 years back they were not able to run in real time. And I, that wasn't really true because you know, at the time, or just before the MEVEA was actually established, this project was made, and this project, I think it was made like 2004, 2005, so almost, well, almost 15 years ago. This is a real-time simulation model that was used to train the operators to learn how to use this, uh, this crane that is a queen in a collar. 
And the idea of that trade is to move containers from harbor to ship another way around. And uh, uh, this is a typical example where the user experience, the user training can be quite expensive because, you know, this is a machine that is operating practically 24 7. And it's not easy to find a slot when beginners can actually start using the machine. And they don't need to do that any longer because they can actually take the simulation model and learn to use the machine by using just the simulator. Okay, that's that one example. Then the fault diagnosis, embedded models, and, uh, and digital twin service. So, how it can be used in a service business? Well, just to explain this to you is that we can actually create a major library about the different faults by using simulation, simulator, simulation model. An example could be like different kind of faults in the hydraulics and we can collect the kind of like major library and whenever we get the signal from the field so we can compare the symptoms and see okay, okay this is the signal and this exactly same procedure though this exactly same happened when we introduced this kind of faults. And now the big library, you can actually teach the big library to artificial intelligence. And when the artificial intelligence is looking at the signal from the field, they can make this diagnostics automatically. So these are the few examples that we introduced in the falls to hydraulics. So uh, you can see how the hydraulic circuit is moving. So the, the, the direction valves are moving, but now there's going to be hose brakes. The hose are deactivated. You can see that, okay, uh, so the operator is no longer able to control the machine. It's behaving really weird way. These are quite obvious, but the similar way we can either use like uh, clearances of all the operations in other hydraulic components. So let's see what happens. More hose breaks. Oh, so it's completely dead now. So that's the way you can create the library. With a, more than this, this is just an example, but this idea, you use it to build a library, and then you, when you have this capabilities to measure your machines in a field, you can collect the data, you can compare the data to the symptoms that are made by using simulation models, and you can actually predict if there is a need for maintenance, and if there is a need for maintenance, what kind of maintenance is needed, and you can have a you know, right kind of spare spars, and tools to go when you go to the field and do the actual modifications or services. Okay, correct process example. This is what we discussed in the case of kinematics. But this is just the idea that you can use embedded models to in a purpose that is called virtual sensor. And the idea of the virtual sensor is that you are measuring the quantities that can be easily measured. In case of bicycle, the easily measured quantities are steering angle leaning angle and forward velocity. And you use those quantities to run the simulation model. Once you run the simulation model, you can actually have full understanding about all the coordinates, all the generalized coordinates of the model. And then once you have that, you can call, you can use the analysis that is called inverse dynamics. And you can have a prediction about the forces and moments that is applying to your system, to your machine. So the idea is that you're measuring simple quantities and with embedded models, you can have more more valuable signals. And the more valuable signals are maybe related to forces, they may be related to something else. But all possible because of the embedded models. Okay, and just one more example. And now the, the most exciting one that what I, what I would like to explain to you next is a new way to introduce the automatic machines. This one is uh, related to system level optimization and then change automation. Excuse me. So, no I mentioned that we can run things in real time. When even this most complicated model that probably is, the, is, an, is an excavator, we can use a standard computer with a standard CPU unit and uh, when we're computing everything in real time, often we have to wait. I mean, all the computational operation is done. Then we have to wait a little while to make sure that, you know, the real time is hitting to us. Once the real time is hitting to us, then we get to go. Then we're reading the signals from joysticks. We're sending the 
the visualization, the visual, visualization unit, whatever that may be, and then we compare it the next time step. But typically, there is a need to wait a little while because we can compute faster than real time, a little bit faster than real time. And if we get this idea faster than real time in extreme cases, we can compute much faster than real time. Say that we can compute thousand times faster than real time. And when we compute it fast, thousand times faster than real time, it gives us kind of like ability to see what will happen in the future. Because you know, now if my computing, if I need to compute fraction of say one second, and I can compute that the one second, you know, much much faster than one second, I can actually see what will happen after this one second using these certain settings. Now it's possible to look at the different motion possibilities, motion scenarios, and see what happens in different motion scenarios in the future. And then it's possible to combine that with artificial intelligence, which is actually selecting the most desired motion in the future. So it's a little bit about, the, are you following me? No, are you doing? Okay, let's look at an, an animation that explains what's the deal. So, so here is a, okay, you know this Angry Birds game? You know, Angry Birds is a, is a game that you're shooting this bird who wanted to hit certain, certain object. What if you have the ability to see what will happen in the future? And you can get this ability by competing much faster than real time. You can see what are the consequences of your shooting. And this is explaining the consequences. You see what is happening? So I'm shooting like all the possible consequences. So then, you know, before shooting, I can see this is what will happen in the future. You got it? And this is this kind of like ability to predict. So it's based on much faster than real-time computing. When we have this ability to predict, then we can actually have many different motion scenarios and we can all protect them in the future and they select the most desired one. This gives us the ability to see the consequences. It's kind of like having a machine awareness. Awareness about you know, physical laws. Like if I do this, this is what's going to happen to me. So I'm not going to do it, but I will, I will select the different motion scenario. And this is something that uh, is true from the game technology. It's already used there. This is a professor, this Perto Hamelainen. He's a professor in all the university. And this is an example how you predict if you cross the road, like shown here. It's all possible because of this ability to predict, ability to see what will happen in the future. But this is based on the faster than real time computing. What do you think about this? So, this could be the possible future of the simulation. It could be used as embedded models to see, you know, then change the automation. Maybe you can make a completely automatic machines such a way that you have this capability to see what will happen in the future. And then you're always selecting the most desired action. And this is how you can make automated machines. Terminators. Terminator is based on that, is it not? I think it is. Remember in that movie, there was this a very powerful CPU unit. I guess what it's doing is that using this faster than real-time computing. And remember, in a, in a movie, the machine got awareness. This is where, where everything got started. Remember that? This is serious. Now, this is, this is becoming serious. Predictive simulation, that's what we wanted. This is what we now this is used in a game environment and games. The games they're using this technology already. We wanted to take this technology to machines and see if it can really do something. Okay, so there's one more slide about this stuff. And then we're almost ready to wrap up this uh, real-time simulation part. 
Picard on this. So this is another YouTube video that is uh, about the machine learning. It's like always that you can use uh, neural networks together with these faster than real time simulation. But then you can really have a quick realistically walking. And walking is extremely difficult to do realistically. You know, the first example is a predictive. This is still predictive uh, simulation. But as you can see, the walking is like, it's like when you're walking in a Friday evening. That's when you're heavily intoxicated. I think this is like, a, I don't know what's the, how, much, how many vodkas is needed to make the walking like that. And many. So, uh, but then if there is a, you know, this, this neural networks involved to this predictive stimulation, then uh, eventually it started to look like quite all right. Quite all right. And even if you send the disturbances, they, uh, Quite all right. But the thing is, you know, it's not falling down. It's not falling down. You know, some, some of the motions are looking a little bit funny, but other than that, it's all right. This, this is the idea. So it's based, this is a concept about uh, model predictive control. I'm not going to go into details on this, but this is like what is happening inside there. How is that we wanted to extend this to machines? Okay, in-house communication. I, wanna, I don't want to explain about that. It's like, you know, companies, it's a, typically an effort to try, try to people to work together. But there is this uh, FMO, FMI that it kind of helps in that perspective. That's, uh, that's by the way, is a standard. From Daimler, I think the Daimler is the one that initiated that from Germany. So uh, is it possible to have many people involved to simulate and certain, certain kind of details of the models are belonging to the different people? They can all see the big picture all the time. So the idea is that even if you're specialized to hydraulics, you can make modifications to hydraulics, you can still go and try to how it feels in the entire machine as a assembled entity. And that's all possible because of that standard. But uh, again, I don't want to discuss about this in details and just conclusion the conclusion is this so we have to follow this principle which says that the mechanics must be combined with the actuators that must be combined with the control system but the user must be accounted now these are the these are the you know the information you can get more information from here lut.fi slash sim that's where you can find information about this uh, platform and the YouTube channel is listed here as well. These are the teams that I'm cooperating with. These are the sponsors. So all of them are Finnish companies. And this is the almost the last one. One more after this. So this is L G. What comes next? T. Correct. There is T. And this is our current president, not the one that initiated the same platform is seriously lost okay so that's about it now we'll close this one and i will uh, right away to move on to summary any questions or comments what makes sense do you believe the terminator do you believe this uh possibility to predict what will happen in the future. No? We'll see. We'll see what will happen. Oh, this guy, this guy lost the connections. I need to put the connection back. Looks good. And then uh, here. No, no, not this one. I wanna, oh, yeah, this one. This is the one that I want to use. Okay.
the need to check. Okay, it seems to be very good in the YouTube too. Good. So here are the topics. So we only have four items, except one item includes quite many details. The four items that I'm expecting you to know when you're going to read an exam. So uh, the first one is embedded technique. Look at the ratings. Ratings is medium, so three stars. So if you're extremely busy, if you're heading to, uh, I don't know, Lapland or St. Petersburg, or you just have better things to do, you may skip this. You may skip the embedded model. But if you're aiming for a good grade, you must learn the embedded models. And then uh, the one thing that you cannot skip is a modeling of hydraulics because it's rated as uh, five stars. And for bubble bodies, you can easily skip. Although there is not that much effort to learn that in details, so it should be all right. Real-time simulation, and put it there as a five stars. That I think it is, you know, you just go and uh, take a look at the recording one more time and you're good. Because I'm not expecting you, I'm not asking, okay, What's the formulation that I we're using in a real time simulation? We don't do that. But I'm not asking, okay, what about some details about the Unity or Unreal Engine? I may ask, okay, what's the, the game you like most? So what it is? You, what is the game you play? What? What? Yes, what? <laughs> okay, now you need to change that. You need to start playing. You need to start playing something. So, so but I don't I don't trust you guys. So what what are, what are the games you play? So you're playing oh please, that's uh, like the most boring game ever. So you can do so seriously, what is a game? You're using uh, what is a game you playing playing? I have never heard. Fortnite? Fortnite, that's for kids, is it? <laughs> yeah, for you then. So, let me think about what was the rainbow, rain, what was the one day? Rainbow Six. Are you like that? All right. Okay, so what is the game that you play? Okay, never mind. Okay. All right, so, no, let's figure out what are the things that I'm, I want, to, I want you to learn, but not before entering into that. Remember this, this is what I represented in the very first class. I said that there are two mandatory items, written exam and simulation work. And written exam, you're not quite yet there because it consists of either two midterm exams or one written exam. So you pass the one midterm exam, but another one is coming. But they're equally important. What I see that happens sometimes is that, you know, people are catching a little bit of up-nose attitude when they're scoring high from the first midterm exam. So they're thinking, oh, God, I'm this good. So I'm like, really, the, you know, the best ever. And, uh, you know, I'm just, I can do whatever I want and still scoring high. Don't think about that because you may be surprised when you go to the next exam. You still need to study. You still need to look at the recordings. You still need to look at the lecture note. You make sure that you are prepared when you go to the next exam. Because it will be my desire to see that you're scoring high from the next next, next uh, midterm exam. Your simulation work will be acceptable. And then your weekly homework is acceptable as well. So you can get extra points out of that. And then uh, in-class quizzes is ac acceptable. And your grade will be 5 out of 5. If you do that, you can really congratulate yourself. Yes. Minus one. Okay, this minus one meaning that uh, if you do a really lousy job, really that uh, John, if John hates you big time, he have this power to give you minus one. So even if you get, like, hypothetically, you get uh, from the first midterm exam, you can get uh, four. Second midterm exam, you can get uh, three. So this is going to be 7. 7 divided by 2 will be 3.5. So it will be 4. Okay? So that's this part. Then the next part that is mandatory is simulation work. And uh, don't hate you like seriously. And he gives you 
minus 1. So then I got the minus 1 here. So then it goes here. 4 minus 1 is 3. Is, but the, typically the minus is used in one particular case only. And there's one particular case that we always automatically use the minus 1. You want to know what is that? Late submission. Late submission and you will automatically get minus 1. No matter how good is your report, how matter how is your pitiful is your model, we don't care. Because if you're late, you're late. We want to punish you. We want to penalize you because of that. And there's a reason behind because you know we are under the constant monitoring because we want to. There's a you know the, this student affairs office. I don't know who it is, but they're monitoring us and they want us to submit the grades as soon as possible. And now we are, we used to be so soft in the past that we were waiting the last ones to submit their simulation assignment and then send the full package to the student affairs office. And sometimes what happened was that we were close to that limit and we got warnings from that office. We don't do that anymore. So we, once, we, once the deadline is passed, then we collect all the, all the information, we send the information to the student affairs office. And now if you're late, it means that there's an extra work for us. Because of it, the work for us, we want to view the software. It's simple like this. Okay. So remember, it's still halfway done. Halfway done. Another half is still to go. And that's another exam. And it is week 51. Business as usual, you have two attempts. So do the first attempt early in the week uh, 51, and then another one, whatever, you have a time. But even the first attempt. By the way, last time did you use two attempts? You just you just use one attempt. Why? Oh, look at that. So I what I'm sensing here, up nose attitude. So uh, <laughs> careful with that. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, of course, if you're scoring five out of five, makes no sense to do another attempt. Well, to me, the exam. Yeah, I know. Okay, the better technique. And I still have, what it is, five minutes. I'm going to use a little more than a five minutes to wrap this up. So the better technique, four star, three stars. Idea was this. You know, when you use a concept of virtual work, you have this equation which says that I have inertia force is equal to external applied force is multiplied by virtual displacement. And we wanted to express the virtual displacement, this one, that's the way that is kinematically admissible. If it is kinematically admissible, then, and only then, you can set this equation to be equal to zero. That's the very, very critical requirement. Okay, so how is that you can express this such the way that is kinematically admissible? Because it is not, in a general case, if you have a constraints. <clears throat> Well, you can use a technique that is called coordinate partitioning. You're categorizing your coordinates to two different categories that are dependent coordinates and independent coordinates. Number of dependent coordinates is equal to the number of constraints. Number of independent coordinates is equal to the number of degrees of freedom. Then you can do the selection as, as you want, and then you can uh, do the selection, and you can apply the selection to the copy of matrix as well, and now you can express the virtual displacement such the way that is kinematically possible, kinematically admissible. Okay, so now you can submit this here, and you can set this equation to be equal to zero. That's the idea of embedded technique. Okay, by the way, another, another question about the exam. When you're in an exam situation, do you have a time or do you use the videos during that? Are you using a YouTube as a, you know, one thing to help you to answer the questions? No, you don't. You do. Lexanos. Yeah, Lexanos is better than uh, YouTube. Because YouTube is like very lengthy. And very exactly this is mentioned. Too difficult. Too time consuming. Maybe what if we're going to change the timing for the lecture like 12 hours. One attempt. 10 hours. Well, that was is that something that is re you recommend me to do next year? No. No. Two hours is good. Okay. All right. 
So this, you know, back to this one here, you know, the problem we have still is this guy here. I have all the coordinates. So I need to use a coordinate partitioning in that level too. And I'm using this kind of matrices that I'm calling B and D. And now with help of B and D, I can express my equation of motion as it is shown here. I would expect you to know that the, if you're using this technique, the number of differential equations will be the equal to the number of degrees of freedom. How you know that? You know that because this is the independent coordinates. This is the no equal than the number of these coordinates are equal to the number of degrees of freedom. Okay? Hydraulics. Very important. And these are the items that I'm expecting you to learn in the hydraulics. Modeling of liquids. Plant fluid theory, flow types, modeling of hydraulic components. So, uh, modeling of uh, hydraulics, the, the properties of fluids, viscosity and the bulk models are the two important things. Out of these two important things, make sure you understand what is a bulk model. Make sure you understand what is a bulk model and the effective bulk model. What's the difference? The bulk model is this theoretical way to express the the relationship between the displacement, excuse me, the volume and the pressure, and the effective bulk modulus accounts all the components that affects the flexibility of hydraulics. That's the difference. Okay? Then uh, so these are the ex details explanations. So you can uh, go over this example where we actually look at the, the system that consists of two chambers, and then you will be good. And, uh, you know, the effective bulk models can be comp computed by using the equations on here. This is important to understand. Effective bulk models, everything that affects the flexibility is accounted in effective bulk models. Okay, the land flow theory, this is something that we are kind of discretizing the hydraulic circuit. The volumes where we are seeing to be pressed to be equally distributed. And uh, then once we do that, then we can compute the pressures by using this first order differential equation. And what differentiate these volumes from each other is the throttles. Always throttles, no matter how is the components in reality. So this is a differential equation. It could be a simple question like, okay, this is an equation used to compute the hydraulics. Explain me what is this component? Effective part models. Was a physical interpretation of this car here. Volume change. Okay. Okay, then the flow types, two different flow types. There's a laminar flow. For us, important to understand that the flow rate and the press difference is linearly related in the case of laminar flow. In case of turbulent flow, they are quadratically related as shown in this equation. So that's pretty much the core material. Valves, you know, we have these moving components that is described one way or another. Once we know the position of the moving component, then we can compute the flow through the component. We're using the semi empirical approach where we get started from the analytical equations. We manipulate the equations such that unknown parameters can be get from the manufacturer's catalog. That's what we wanted to do. Okay? And this is an example about direction valve. The spool position is described by using this first order delay equation, where this is a time constant of the valve, and this is an input signal. Okay, the cylinder is the one that converts the hydraulic power or hydraulic pressure to mechanical force. The pump is the one that we describe in the flow produced by a pump. This, by the way, is important. Not the pressure, but the flow. Remember you and remember that when you go to exam. Deformable bodies, the same picture that I saw you in the very beginning. So two methods, lamp mass approach and floating frame reference formulation, those are the two things. Look at that. So I'm a little late, but my last slide. Okay, real time simulation, not the last slide, rated as a five stars. I have no example about that. Oh I do. Excuse me. And there is one star missing here, so this is a four star. Remember that you kind of remember this line. Not mentioned in the lecture note, by the way. So this is something that you need to look at from the YouTube. My last slide is this. See you soon. Because remember, there is a cause that is outstanding cause in this universe. And it's like you make a list about the causes 
The first one in the, in the list is this one. Then comes nothing. Then slowly are the courses. This is beautiful course. See you then. It started in the January. First week of second week of January. Okay, that's all. Now I'm gonna close the recording. I'm gonna close the streaming. And uh, hope to see you in a discourse or not. If not in a discourse, then in a corridor. Thanks. Okay, so that was it. You can go now.